Hey, this is Todd Henson, and first thing I want to say is thank you for joining. You're about to see a uh, event I did at the Alliance Rally. Now, the information that I have here is just one hour of what you would get over here at the National RV Training Academy. So sit back, relax, let's go ahead and watch it, and if it's something you like, keep in mind that you can get that information here at the National RV Training Academy. We'll see you then. All right, well, let's jump into solar real quick. Um, the one, uh, one of the things I love about um, working with Alliance is, is they've already, you know, kind of got preemptive on some of this and have really began to get you guys started into the solar program, right? So that you guys have the potential to go ahead and do that. The one thing that we've learned over the last couple of years is, is that RVing is becoming super popular. Now I can tell you, it was already popular before COVID hit, right? If we go back as far back, way, way back to 2019, it was our best year ever. We had over 500,000 new starts. But did you know, new, this is new RVs being bought and sold, you know, made and sold. Did you know that 60% of all RVs are private party? So of that 500,000 a year, that's only 40% of how many RVs were actually moved. So we had over a million moved in 2019. Okay, now in 2016, we had 9 million households actually owned an RV. 2019, we had 1.1 million. Now, 2020, it kind of dipped down just a bit to like 460, 470,000, which happens to be either number two or number three on record. We were still doing just fine. COVID hits, you know, all the restrictions, everything else, all of a sudden, RVing, you know, exploded. We're still looking at the numbers but we're assuming about 650,000 new starts. And again, that's just new starts. But what's not keeping up with this increase? RV parks. It takes a lot to put in an RV park and it takes time to build RV parks, right? And so with this huge influx of new RVers, everything else, we don't have the same capacity when it comes to RV parks. However, there are so many other opportunities, whether it be boondocking, you know, going to Harvest Host, going on the West Coast where there's far fewer RV parks. We have BLM land, you know, Bureau of Land Management, where the government fools you and says it's your land for two weeks, and then it's their land again. Right, but during that, you can, you, you know, we're, we're beginning to learn this. Now, I can tell you as an avid RVer, I get bored, and I, you know, my wife's not here, so I can say this. I get bored at staying at all the RV parks. I get bored at staying at all the resorts, right? I mean, like today, they were saying the resorts, they drive you in. I, I said, well, I'm spending way too much money because I go to the resorts, and no one has ever taken over my vehicle and parked it for me. I mean, I mean I'm not picking the same resorts you guys are, <laughs> right? I'm just like, oh, it's the same. It just costs me twice as much. I get bored at going to the RV parks. I would rather just, you know, for me, so when I grew up, you know, when I first met Stephanie, being in the family, everything else, she goes, hey, this is what my family does, we do RVs. I said, great, you do you, I'll do me, because I grew up in a mobile home. And I equate RVs with mobile home parks. And I remember growing up, you know, my brother, young, he'd sit there, you know, we were looking at, he goes, when I get older, I'm gonna retire, I'm gonna sell the house, I'm gonna buy an RV. This is back in the 80s. Like, why would you ever do that? Right? We're in we're in a RV, I mean, we're in a, a mobile home park. Why would you ever go back? So when I met Stephanie, I had that same thought. She goes, I do RVs, everything else. And I was like, well, great, you do that. I, I do this over here. I'm not even touching an RV. And it wasn't until she showed me that we can travel, right? So she says, what if you want to be in front of the beach? Okay, that's kind of cool. What if you want to go in front of the ocean? Okay, I can't do that with a, a mobile home, but I could do that with an RV, right? And so it wasn't until we started doing it, and then I got totally hooked, was brought in, all of that, right? Well, in most cases, we don't have RV parks that are super close to mountains. We don't have RV parks that are super close to the sh uh, seashore. And of course, anytime travel in between, we have to sit there and schedule all that. And this is where taking your own portable power becomes so much more for us when it comes to RV. So let's go ahead and jump into solar. I'm gonna talk about the benefits of it, talk about why we need it. 
And then I'm going to, I'll go over batteries because I've already got some requests on that. And then I'm going to hold off. I'm going to cut this one a little bit shorter to answer your questions regarding solar because you may have specific ones that I may not have on that list, right? To, just to take a week-long class that I teach and try and confine it into one hour, I, there's no way I can do that. So what I want to do is be cognizant of what, maybe what questions you may have. All right, so let's first jump into this. Any of you kind of delved into solar, you found out it's expensive. So why the heck would we even think about solar when I have a shore cord, All right? So let's look at this here. We have on there, there's enough RV parks with hookups that I don't need solar. If I can't run the air conditioner, it's not worth paying for solar. How many of you still have that mentality? If I can't run my air conditioner, what good is solar? Now, when I started studying this over five years ago, I had that same thought. Hey, solar, we just don't have that technology yet. It's a little pie in the sky kind of thing, right? If it can't run true loads, why have it? Well, guess what we can do now? All right, guess what we can do? Not only can we run one AC, but if your RV is equipped with three ACs, you can run three ACs, okay? We have limited power, but the technology has gotten really great over the last five years that actually makes this worth it. I don't boondock much, so why would I need solar? Any of you fit in that category? You know, my wife is a glamper. She told me, Todd, don't invest in solar unless I can run everything. So what did I hear? Oh, you want, you want me to build a solar system that can run everything. <laughs> Challenge me. <laughs> All right, and then finally we'll get into it cost too much. How many of you looked into it and said, oh, no, thank you. That's expensive. Well, let's start talking about that, right? If we switch over, we'll talk about batteries here in a little bit. You have to switch over the type of battery you have because, of course, with the lead-acid battery you have, it's a jogger. It's not meant to handle heavy loads. We just covered that in the first part. We have to switch the type of battery we have that's no longer a jogger but a sprinter, and that's what those lithium batteries are. They can handle high amp outputs, and they can handle it continuously. Okay? How many of you looked at the cost of a lithium battery? Right? I mean, when they first came out, let's say about four, not when they first came out, but when they really started getting popular about four to five years ago, they're about $1,000 each. They, thankfully, they have come down a lot to about $950 each. <laughs> right? And you say, well, okay, Todd, there's that, right? Then you have to have an inverter, and that inverter may cost you anywhere between $1,200 and $1,500 each. All right, so Todd, if I just invest in a battery and an inverter, I can live off grid, right? Well, no. There's all this stuff in between, right? Just to cut to the chase, if you want a system that goes from, you know, running everything, you're looking at about $16,000 just in equipment. So I want to first shock you with that number, right? Because if you're thinking about, hey, I want to dabble into this, right? My first question usually, you know, with someone is, what kind of rig do you have and what do you want to do with it? Well, you know, I have two ACs and I want to run those. I said, where do you go? Well, I, I have to go to the coast. Is the coast hot? So more than likely you're going to run two ACs, right? So, all right, hey, look, so I just want to tell you, just equipment alone, $16,000. How many of you want to invest $16,000 into your rig? Just, just knowing that. Some of you do. All right. <coughs> now, let's do this. The average overnight stay in an RV park, $45 a night. I want you to take $16,000 and divide it by 45. How long do you think that you would have to RV before you get your money back if you didn't go to RV parks? Let me tell you what that number is. One year. One year. That's all that you're spending. So here's the thought. If you are boondocking, or let's say you're taking your power with you, which is really not boondocking, you're taking your power with you. You are now sitting, in, you know, taking your RV and you're sitting in front of a, you know, a mountain. You're sitting in front of the coast. You have no reservations. You can go wherever you want. All right, and I will tell you, for us, it's a big deal because I very seldom get away. And when I get away, if I come up here, this one, this trip was so short, I had to fly. Right? And believe me, we're at the hotel missing our RV. Okay? We still live in a house, but I live in the RV park, so I'm a full-time RV parker. <coughs> right? Because I teach all the time. When I get away, I only get away two weeks. And when I travel, I have to travel 1,100 miles. I don't get to live the dream like a lot of you. How far do you want to go today? <laughs> 50 miles. One day, I'll get there. So whenever I travel, we travel till we can no longer stay awake. And then we pull over, we wally dock. 
okay? And I take the power with me. I don't have reservations. We pull over. I hate the thought of spending $45 pulling into an RV park at dusk, only to wake up at the crack of dawn, pick up and go. That is a waste for me. I am cheap, right? With stuff I don't want to spend money on. Apparently Stephanie says I'm not so cheap when it comes to tools or solar. <laughs> if I could save that and take my power with me, it only takes me one year of not spending money on RV parks before I get my ROI. Those batteries, I think those of you that are looking into it, you'll find out that those are guaranteed for 10 years. Your, all, your inverters are good for over five years. Your solar panels are good for 25 years. So even though you put in that money, I'm telling you, you're gonna get your money back within 365 days of not staying in an RV park. I'm not saying you're gonna do that continuously, right? But over that time, you're gonna get it back. All right, so first wanna just go ahead and get that out of the way. Let's go ahead and look into a little bit more about solar. Like I said, I'll, anytime someone asks me, because I get this uh, almost every single time, some of you came up, I was thinking about switching over here, I was thinking about this, what do I need? I'll get to that. My first thought is, what do you wanna see yourself doing? How many have been RVing for over five years and you've been to every RV park there is, it seems, right? And then you have your favorites. Did you know that that's, that's less than half of what we can actually see, right? That's less than half of where we could put our RV. If you could take your power with you, wouldn't it be great to be at the foothills, say, of the Grand Tetons? Okay, now, you gone to the Grand Tetons yet? A lot of you have, I mean, 20 miles away is the closest, I mean, there is like one little 100, <laughs> little, uh, little 100 uh, uh, site RV park, real close, everything else is 20 miles away. So you travel a lot just so you can get in your truck or ram, and drive over to the Grand Tetons, right? But do you know it's at the foothills, uh, right at the base there, BLM land, right? Cost you nothing to get in there in two weeks. Definitely worth it. Definitely worth it, okay? Uh, showing up on the beach, I'm in Texas. We've got over 60 miles where you can foolishly park your RV on the coast. Right. I say foolishly because I still watch the, you know, the pictures of people who get too close, don't think about tides, and they come in. They're the same day on people that will go swimming and get eaten by a shark, and then everyone goes, that's funny, we haven't had a shark attack. And I'm like, uh-huh, I watch it. Every year there's a shark attack. Right? Florida, how many RV years you go to Florida? How many of you want to go to Florida? You know, Florida's trying to kill you, right? Sharks, alligators, fallen coconuts, snakes. This is why people go to retire, and by retire, they mean die. <laughs> Ford is trying to kill you. All right, you can take this almost anywhere, okay? For Stephanie, all we had to do was two trips, and it changed, you know, her thought of my spending that much money. <laughs> How dare you? Well, you said you didn't want a solar system unless you can run everything, so that's what I did. I built a solar system that runs everything. All right, for us, travel days. Typically when we take off, we go, to the, we go south. She likes to look at the ocean, which I have no clue why, right? But whenever we show up, how many of you dread you know, getting set up only to wait four or five hours for your air conditioner to catch up? If you have a solar system, like what we do, we run our air conditioner while we're going down the road, right? I call it you know, AC prep. So whenever we put our landing gear down, got our slides out, it's 70 degrees when we walk in. And it cost me nothing. You know, there was that initial part, a little steep, but take that with me. And you'd be surprised at how much that changed her outlook on travel days. Okay? Like I said, for us, we, we tend, you know, not to spend those overnight travel days, you know, go into an RV park. We'll go to the local Walmart or something like that. And when I first started this, I would say, you know, my RV will never, ever, ever darken a Walmart parking lot. And then I did it once. Oh, how awesome was that experience? And I said, all right, this is what we're going to do from now on. How many of you have done the Wally docking? Do you like it? I mean, think about this. All Walmarts, what's real close? There's always a McDonald's and there's always a, you know, a, a Starbucks. I wake up early, you know, the kids are still asleep, Stephanie's still asleep, so I get up and I go into Walmart, 
right? I'm a people watcher. I start counting how many people still have their moo moos on, right? <laughs> there were seven in this old Walmart. Yeah. Wait for them to wake up. We walk over to McDonald's because, come on, let's face it, they still do a decent breakfast, right? And then get our coffee, walk back in the vehicle. Here's the thing. I don't even unhitch. Pull out the slide just a bit so we can get past it. I put my front landing gear down just to relieve because I have a Dodge. I don't want that pin weight sitting on that truck all night, right? Just put down my landing gear just a bit. But 7 o'clock, wake up, take off, all right? Oh, I love those days. There's a lot of intangibles when it comes to solar, but you know, my job isn't really to convince you of the solar. My job is to let you know of the possibilities. Okay, so let's jump into a little bit more about this, right? I just started off with $16,000. Do you have to spend $16,000 to begin your solar journey? No, they're all different sizes, all different sizes. Now, I will say that solar is a misnomer. It's actually a pet peeve of mine when I hear that term because solar just simply refers to solar panels. And that's one of four ways that we can charge our batteries, right? The main thing when we're talking about taking portable power with us is going to be batteries and an inverter. There's where the magic takes place. The inverter takes that 12 volts, creates 120, so we can run those large appliances. Where do we get that power from? The batteries. The batteries, and therefore, the question is, is how many batteries do we need, okay? It all depends on how much money you have. All right, so let's get into the different components. Now, a basic solar setup is just a way to recharge the batteries. Now, a lot of you, especially with your um, um, RV that you have now, you've got one or two solar panels up there. And guess what they do? They go ahead and top off that battery. They keep it charged as long as there's not a huge load, <coughs> right? Most solar panels, they're rated based on their watts. What's their watt output? 100 watts, 200 watts, 300 watts. You just <coughs> learned from the first section, right? All I did in order to figure out watts is I take the voltage out, divide that, you know, the, the watts by the voltage, and I get my amps, whichever, right, in order to get that number. All right, so we're just looking at our solar panels. Our solar panels are just one <coughs> of four ways for us to actually charge our batteries. Did you know your solar panels? Do you have to match your solar panels, the voltage from your solar panels to your batteries? Does it make sense that we do that? No, you don't have to, but does it make sense? Yes. Yeah, it makes sense. Our batteries are kind of particular, right? We have to have a certain amount of voltage to charge those batteries. Now, we learned in the first section that we have a converter that charges our lead-acid batteries. Does anyone know the voltage output of a standard RV converter? Between 13.2 and 13.6, right, in order to charge a lead-acid battery. What is the voltage of a fully charged lead-acid battery? 12.7, 12.6, 12.7, okay? Now, I just want you to think of this, right? If I took a charger and I only charged at 12.7 volts, I've got a battery that can produce up to 12.7 volts. The two meet, which one wins? Same amount of pressure, right? Neither one of them wins. So my converter cannot fully charge a lead acid battery at 12.7 volts. It has to overcome the pressure from that battery. This is why your converter charges at about 13.2 to 13.6. Small amount, a little bit more internal resistance, right? We're charging those batteries. You guys asked about batteries, I'm sorry. All right. Now, does it make sense where I'm getting back at this, right? Does it make sense that we have these solar panels up there? Does it make sense that we go ahead and match that voltage in some way? How do we take a solar panel? Well, what voltage comes from a solar panel? Does anyone know? It varies. What does it vary on? Well, you got series and parallel. Okay, beyond that, what varies if I just had one panel? Sun strike. All right, so I want you to think about this. With solar panels, what are we actually doing? We're taking energy from light and creating, of course, a charge. All right, so let's think about this. I have a solar panel sitting on top of my RV. And I've got the sun coming up in the morning. Is the sun coming up in the morning enough sun strike in order to create enough voltage to charge my batteries? No. 
once the sun gets to a certain point, then I've got a certain amount of voltage coming out. Okay? And then it goes down. I have all this varying voltage in between. Can I tell you, there's no solar panel out there that is rated at 12.7 volts. There's no solar panel out there that's rated at 13.2 volts. They're strangely way higher, you know, between 20 volts all the way up to 60 volts. If you think 60 volts is too much to charge my batteries, too much pressure to charge my batteries safely, yes. So there should be some type of device between my solar panel and my battery. What do you think that device is? A charge controller, right? What does a charge controller do for us? Regulate. Regulates, kind of like a converter. Now a converter does what again? Converts. Converts. AC to, or DC to AC. AC to DC. All right, high voltage to low voltage. A converter takes high voltage and creates low voltage oh, okay. in the RV space, right? 120 volts down to 12 volts. Do you know your solar panels can get upwards of 120 volts, can get up to 150 volts. So when I say a solar controller, I want you to think converter, right? It's gonna take that high voltage, step it down to battery voltage, and change it to battery voltage. All right, so you have a solar panel, you have a solar controller, and it's doing what for us again? Just simply charging that battery, okay? Now, what does the battery do for us? Storage, right? Potential energy. All right, so we have this thought. Okay, I want to take my RV out. I want to go ahead and, you know, live off-grid. I want to take my power with me. Now, if I have a ton of solar panels, I can figure out, okay, well, I just want to run my TV. My TV pulls about 150 watts. Can I get away with that if I had a, say, three 200-watt panels? I got 600 watts coming in. Got an inverter. Can I run a TV that's only pulling 150 watts if I have... 600 watts on the roof. Sure. Until when? The Until the sun goes away. Right? Because those are solar panels, not lunar panels. <laughs> All right. So what do we need in our solar build in order to run things? Batteries. Storage. Right? We need those storage. All right. So just going over these components, we have our solar panels. We have a solar controller taking that weird, strange voltage coming from the solar panel down to battery voltage, all right? Now, we wanna watch the same TV at night, right? New season of Yellowstone comes out. Ooh, okay, gotta watch that, gotta binge it. I've got one battery because I'm starting off with just one battery, 100 amp hour battery, 12 volts. How long can I watch that 150 watt TV? Oh, I'm mathing you guys, aren't I? <laughs> I've got 10 amp hours at 120 volts. 10 times 120 is my wattage, 1,200 watts. I'm pulling 150 watts. Just enough to get through a season, right? Now my battery is DEAD. Can I run anything tomorrow? <laughs> when the sun comes up, where is all that electricity going? To the battery, not to the TV. So I always get questions, how many batteries do I need? Well, two things, how much space do you have? How much money do you have? You need all the batteries. <laughs> all right, so let's start looking at our components here, right? So we've talked about our solar panels. We've talked about just a little bit about our solar controller, going over to our batteries. We need a certain amount of batteries based on what we wanna run. Now let's look at the biggest thing in the, in the whole solar panels, or in the solar system, and that's gonna be our inverter. Our inverters are rated based on a certain amount of wattage output, right? You buy that based on the wattage output. Can I get a small inverter just to run one appliance? Sure. And whenever the first, when RVs first started coming out with inverters, we ran one appliance. What was that one appliance? Our fridge, right? Ran our fridge because we wanted our food to stay cold as we're going down the road, whichever, all right? After a while, we figured out, well, it could do more than the fridge. So we can get a little bit bigger inverter or something like that. Hey, while we're out there, can it run the fridge? Maybe the TV. Because as RVers, that's what we should do, right? Stay in the RV and watch TV all day. <laughs> but can that inverter, can we get one big enough to run, say, some of our bigger components? Let's, let's start talking our coffee. Yep. Can it run our coffee pots? Can it run our air conditioners? Yep. All right. 
So now we start putting all this together. So our inverters are rated based on the wattage output. Okay. If we look at our air conditioner, because of course that's, that's kind of popular for us, right? We need to, we're going somewhere in our RV, we don't want to be limited based on heat, so let's have an air conditioner take care of the air, or the temperature inside the RV. I need an, an inverter big enough to run at least one AC. How do I factor in, how do I know how much power my air conditioner is using? Go to the placard on the air conditioner. Go to the placard on the air conditioner, so you go up there and look, and guess what's not on there? It's consumption. All right, air conditioners, they vary based on heat. But let's look at this. Let's go to the breaker. Is our air conditioner isolated? Does it have its own breaker? Have y'all figured that out yet? That our air conditioners have its own breaker? Typically, what rating is that breaker? 20 amps. So I can figure out the potential wattage of my air conditioner by taking 20 amps times 120 volts. The so maximum it's going to pull continuously roughly is around 2,400 watts. So if I want to run my air conditioner, what size inverter do I need minimum? About 3,000 watts, right? So we start putting this together. Well, it all depends. Right, so there is something when we talk about the startup, and there's a way around that, all right? So yeah, we do have startup, we call it LRA, locked rotor amps, just like anything else. Have y'all figured out the older you get, the harder it is to get out of bed? Anyone still get up like you're a spring chicken, jump out of bed and go? What have you learned? I know for, here's my, you know, I used to be able to get up, take off. Now I get up, I have to sit at the edge of the bed. And then I have to like tell my knees, hey, I'm up. I'm about to put a load on you. Are you awake? Right, because there's been a couple times I got up thinking that my, le my knees would respond and my knees said, what? And it goes straight down to the ground. I also have to help myself get out of bed with my hands. Do you know your air conditioner has the same problem. When your compressor kicks on, it needs help. Right, this is what he's talking about here. We have a capacitor on there that actually hits that compressor with about 60 amps in order to get it going. Average compressor in the RV space needs about 60 to 80 amps just in the very beginning to get it going. He's saying, well, Todd, if you have a 2400 watt or 3000 watt inverter, is that enough to hit that 60 amps? No, but there's ways around that. That's where the soft start comes in or something like that. All right, so I know that I'm kind of running some numbers around you, but this is how we actually put this together. Okay, this is how we put it together. What do you see yourself doing? What components do you need? Let's just look at batteries because I know that this comes up quite a bit. When we're talking about taking um, our batteries and making them into high performance, you know, from 12 volts to 120 volts, we have different options. This is what I love about the Alliance fleet. Okay, depending on which model you have, it already comes with a lithium battery. I have up here just a, whoop, sorry, I'm off one, one slide here. I'm, I have a comparison of what our lead acid batteries perform at. Let me give you some information. I think you already know this. Your lead acid battery, of course, we're talking about our deep cycle batteries. I want to compare them, if I were to look at the Olympics, I want to compare them to the Olympians. Your lead acid battery, deep cycle battery, is a jogger. It is a marathon runner. It is not built, it is not designed for us to handle he heavy loads. It is not a starter battery. Your starter battery, like a sprinter, hard and fast out of the blocks, doesn't run very long. Your deep cycle battery, jogger, can handle small loads very long time, right? It can run that light, it can turn on that fart fan, run that fart fan for a while. Now, we're talking about using an inverter that takes 10 times the amperage in order to go from 12 volts to 120 volts. Is it smart for us to use a jogger type battery in order to perform that? No. Your standard lead acid battery, continuous amp output is about 45 to 50 amps. That would be four to five amps at 120 volts, right? In order for me just to run my air conditioner, I would need four lead acid batteries and cross my fingers. All right. What do we know about lead acid batteries? 
We know that we put them on the outside of the RV. Why do they put them on the outside of the RV? They off gas, right? We have a chemical reaction inside there. I have water, I have electrolyte. I'm just moving the electrons from the anode rod over to the cathode rod. In order to do that, I have to use water as a medium. Well, I pull out the hydrogen when I do that, right? I separate water. Now, oxygen comes out. Can we breathe oxygen? Yes. Can we breathe hydrogen? No. <laughs> Not very long. <laughs> This is why the, the batteries are on the outside, is because we off-gas hydrogen, okay? Whenever we put them under heavy loads, we off-gas, right? This is why the batteries are sitting on the outside. Now, typical battery has 100 amp hours, right? Whenever you get your lead-acid battery, you know it's rated at 100 amp hours. What do you know about that lead-acid battery? Can you get 100 amp hours out of that thing? What do they tell you? No less than, you know, no more than 50% draw. Right? They're lying to you. It's kind of like makeup. <laughs> here's what we're going to sell you, and here's what you can actually use. All right, so we know that with our lead-acid batteries, we can only use about 50% of it. Once we get beyond that, again, chemical reaction, I'm burning up the water. All I have left is electrolyte. Electrolyte dries out, crystallizes, falls to the bottom. Can't use it as much. I don't have the same capacity I once did. We call that stratification. So for best use, don't get it more than 50%. If I'm wanting a battery to be a high performance battery and use it to create heavy loads, should I use a battery that only gives me 50% discharge? Probably not. Does your battery, whenever you guys, how many of you don't RV right, you put your RV up for the winter? Some of you, okay. So when you put it up for the winter, what happens to your battery when you come back after the winter? What, comes, what happens to your battery? It is dead. Did you know a lead acid battery self-discharges? Roughly one volt every 30 days. So if you just took two months off, now I know that you might have got this from the dealership, but I wanna, I wanna give you some more information. How do them tell you, hey, if you're gonna store your RV, simply go over to your battery disconnect and turn your battery disconnect off, and that will stop the parasitic loads, and your battery will be fine. No, this is the old adage, if you don't use it, you lose it. Right? We just know with lead-acid batteries, they self-discharge. Give it 30, 60 days, that battery is dead. Okay, these are just lead-acid batteries. Are those things heavy? Yes. Sure they are. About the average uh, battery is about 60 pounds. Is weight a factor in the RV space? All right. Do you also know that your batteries, your lead-acid batteries, have a lifespan? Right? They usually do it in cycles. Now a cycle is to have it fully charged, discharge it to 50%, charge it back up, they call that one cycle. The average lead acid battery has about 300 cycles, three to 500 cycles in it. Now with a lead acid battery, I have water in there and if I discharge it quite a bit, I lose that water. So what do I need to do with our, my battery from time to time? Add water, what kind of water do we use? Why do we use distilled water? Minerals, right? If I'm discharging, right? I got these minerals on the bottom that mix in with the salt. It's not as good. Now, how many of you actually check your lead acid batteries from time to time and add water on a continuous basis? Notice that not everyone rose, raised their hands, right? For most of us, we just use it till it no longer charges and then we go buy another one. Anyone bold enough to raise their hand and say, yep, that's what I do. I use it till it doesn't work anymore and I buy another one. Right? So there's a lot of maintenance that comes in with these lead acid batteries. All right? Now, I'm going to compare that to a lithium battery. So I want you to know everything that you know about lead acid batteries and think the exact opposite. And that's a lithium battery. So let's go through them. The first one that I, I think I talked about is they off gas, right? Lead acid batteries off gas. Lithium batteries do not off gas. So, we also learned that these lithium batteries are about $1,000 each. Does anyone want to take a lithium battery and stick it outside their RV? You say no, why? Right, they grow legs and they walk off. Does anyone here have a lithium battery sitting on the outside of their RV? Tell me what site you're at and I will alleviate that problem. So this gives us more options of where we can put this battery. If they don't off gas, then they're not a problem for us. This opens up possibilities. Now, with lithium batteries, they don't self-discharge. 
It takes six months to discharge a lithium battery. They don't discharge. I mean, they do, but it's such a nominal amount that we say six months. Okay? Now, we talk about weight. They're about half the weight of a lead-acid battery. If I just take a standard 100-amp-hour lithium battery, it's about half the weight, about 28 pounds. Weight's an issue. Now, let's start talking performance, because this is where we all look at this. A standard lead-acid battery is $80 to $120, depending on which sticker they stick on the front of it. You figure out there's only two or three battery manufacturers out there. Everyone else just sticks their label on it. All right. So $120 versus $950. Todd, great, you're telling me I could put this anywhere. You're telling me that I can use you know, uh, more of it than I can with a lead acid battery, but that doesn't sell me. Let's look at the cycles of these things. A lead acid battery, about 300 to 500 cycles. The lithium battery is anywhere between 5,000 and 10,000 cycles, okay? There's a huge variance between 5,000 and 10,000. It all depends on how much we charge it. This is simple to understand. If I asked you guys to sprint to your RV, show of hands, how many of you think you can make it to your RV in a dead sprint? Is yours right outside? I got about six steps in front of me on a sprint before my leg goes out. <laughs> all right, now if I asked you to jog to your RV, how many of you, show of hands, a few more. If I asked you to walk to your RV, still more. The same is true when it comes to batteries, right? If I charge them up 100%, I'm only gonna get so many cycles. If I back that down just a little bit, I can nearly double my cycles. Now a cycle again is, you know, to be 50% discharged and charge all the way back up. Oh, by the way, lithium batteries, I don't have that false bottom. I can discharge it 100%, charge it back up does not hurt the lithium battery. How many of you have a cell phone? You forget to charge your cell phone. Totally dead, you just plug it back in, charges right back up, no harm, no foul. What kind of battery do you think is in your cell phone? A lithium battery, okay? You're not going to hurt it. So a cycle is more than 50%, but you're going from 300 to 500 cycles to 5,000 to 10,000 cycles. Do you think that extends the life of that battery? 10 years on a guarantee, and do you think that after 10 years that battery is no longer any good? This is what happens with these things. It's a different chemical reaction altogether. It's different, all right? So after about 10 years, what will happen is if that battery started off at 100 amp hours, I may get 70 amp hours at the end of 10 years. 70 amp hours. So you're gonna throw away a battery that gives you 70 amp hours? That's it, I'm done. I'm going back to lead acid where I get 50 amp hours out of my 100 amp hour battery. No, we just derate it to 70 amp hours and now you still use it. So here's the thing, we call these things lifetime batteries. If I look out, right, I'm gonna close my eyes because I'm not gonna look at anyone when I say this. Based on your age, these batteries are gonna last longer than you. <laughs> I'm serious, they will literally last longer than you. So, I mean, yes, there is that, you know, expense of purchasing them, but if you treat those right, they will perform longer than you, definitely longer than your RV, right? Definitely longer. Not saying that RVs are, they're good for about five, 10 years, right? Then after that, you get bored. There's a new model that comes out, new floor plan. We all buy on floor plan. How many of you forgot and you didn't buy on floor plan? Anyone here not buy on floor plan? You just bought on the looks. No, you buy on floor plan. New floor plan comes out, they do something better. Ooh, let's upgrade, right? Now you just got that question. Okay, Todd, I've got eight batteries in there. I want to trade in my RV. What do I do? You take seven batteries with you. Right? You leave one lithium in there because you can say, hey, this RV has a lithium battery in it. All right. This is where we get the money out of that. If we looked at it just from a watts perspective, I'm gonna spend about 32 cents per watt with a lead acid battery. I can cut that by four on the totality of a lithium battery. It's actually cheaper for me to use a lithium battery. But what are the considerations? If I look at a lithium battery, I crack it open, there's four different cells in there. Each cell produces 3.65 volts. So if you have a lithium battery, you will notice that it's at 14.6 volts, completely charged. I just asked you in the very beginning, 
What is our standard RV converter push voltage at on a lead acid battery? 13.2 to 13.6. Okay, now there's one thing that we also need to know about electrons, the same thing with voltage. Wow, y'all can't even see that, can you? All right, so just pretend that that's bright. All right, can a standard converter at 13.6 fully charge a lithium battery that wants to be at 14.6? No, okay? So what is a consideration besides spending the 900 bucks for that lithium battery? What do we need to consider? Right, the type of converter we have. The type of converter we have. Do we have one that's only set for lead acid or do we have that wonderful switch that we can go from LA to LI? Right, the great thing about you know, uh, working with alliances, they already thought of that and they said, you know what, we're gonna buy the converters that give us the option to go ahead and switch that. So you guys don't have to spend any more money when it comes to switching over, okay? Now beyond that, you know, like if you have six or 12 batteries or however many you have, you may wanna step up the charger at that point. But if you're spending six or 12, you know, money on six or 12 batteries, all right, an inverter or charger is not gonna be anything for you. I want to just give you, you know, those three, now there's, there's always components in between, but I want you to look at this. I was talking about different charge sources. Right now, you know, and I gave you guys the scenario, of course, your battery's dead, you're plugged into your truck, and you're plugged into shore power. How many of you know fully that you can charge from your truck and charge from your converter at the same time, that your battery can take two charge sources at the same time? You can do that, you do not hurt it. You can be plugged in with your seven pin connector and charged it, you know, being charged from your converter when you're plugged into shore power. Now you add solar panels. Remember from the solar panels to the solar controller, from the solar controller to your batteries. Can I have three sources charging my battery at once? Okay, sure can. All right, this is the cool thing about DC power. One direction, right? As long as I'm not exceeding the charge profile on my battery, I can have as many charge sources as possible. If we're taking the power with us, if the batteries is going to be the heart and soul, and of course our inverter takes that and takes the 12 volts to 120 volts, that's the heartbeat, right? Then I need to have some good charge sources. If you have an alliance switching over to lithium batteries, not that big of a deal because most of you already have the converter that will switch over. If you do not, now you need to consider going with, you know, a particular battery charger that handles <coughs> lithium. I want to run some for instances for you, okay? Just to kind of give you some numbers. When you're looking at your battery choice or how many you have, you have 100 amp hours, right? Again, if you're just thinking, well, I want to run my air conditioner, what does 100 amp hours mean? Okay. Well, you know, your air conditioner is on a 20 amp breaker, 20 amps. I know that my 100 amp hour battery is 100 amp hours at 12 volts. How many amps is it at 120 volts? 10. So how many batteries minimum, lithium batteries minimum, do I need in order to run that air conditioner just to start it? Two. Now, if I have two 100 amp hour batteries, 100 amp hours at 12 volts, 10 amps, 10 amp hours, at 120 volts, I turn on that one air conditioner, how long will those two batteries get me with that air conditioner? Depends on your load. Depends on your load and how that air conditioner. Just the air conditioner, let's say it's just the air conditioner. <laughs> We're in a mythical world where there's nothing else on in our RV but our air conditioner. At 100% duty cycle. Right, at 100% duty cycle, right? One hour max. All right, because I know that some of you, this it's always the question, well, how many, this is what I wanna do, I wanna run my air conditioner about for about four or five hours. How many batteries do I need? Two, two to get you an hour, right? At 100% duty cycle. Let's say you you're foolishly went to Florida. 100 degree weather, 200% humidity, right? It's 100% duty cycle. And you went down there with one AC. I question your decision-making skills. <laughs> All right, so this is how we factor that in, okay? Basically, it's how much room do you have? How much money do you have? I can make it pretty convenient. All right. In my system, I have two inverters that are 5,000 watts each. I've got a, a 10,000 watt system just on my inverters. I build my own batteries. That's just because I, I tinker. 
and I have eight 300 amp hour batteries. I'll put it to you this way. It only takes up about one foot off my wall, eight foot long. I can run one AC for 11 hours straight, 100% duty before my batteries give out, not counting the solar panels up top. I did that because of course, at night. During the day I have solar panels. During the day I can run my generator. I can't run my generator at night, right? Can't, don't have lunar panels. So I wanted to make sure I had enough battery power to run my air conditioner all the way through the night. Okay, so it can be done. I can run three ACs for about four hours straight. It can be done, it just depends on how much money, how much time you have. I wanna stop here because I know that some of you have questions and it always lingers with me because I don't have a week with you guys. I wanna find out what questions you may have when, in regards to solar so that way I can pinpoint. You're sitting here for a reason, right? What questions may you have, do you have with solar? Now, first off, before you ask your questions, a lot of you get your arms crossed. This means you're closed off, you're not listening, right? You're not receiving what I'm saying. This hurts me. Oh, you're just tired I'm working on my formula here. What's law? All right, any questions on this? I mean, I can keep going. Oh, well, yes, yes. Sure. A lot of us have the same thing. A lot of us have gotten the factory solar on our rig. Right. And I've got the paradigm. I don't have the Bauer, which has the big. The I've solar plus, the, right. Yeah, I've got the regular uh, lead battery. First off, uh, the only thing I'm really worried about is my residential fridge running it while we're going down. Uh, okay. Well, let's look at what we have. Now, do you have the 12 volt refrigerator no. model? So you have just the standard residential. Now, residential refrigerator is gonna pull about anywhere between 600 and 800 watts, okay? If I take a, you know, a standard lead acid battery, 100 amp hours. 100 amp hours times 12 volts gives me 1200 watts. If I could drain that battery 100%, I know that my refrigerator, when it's on cycle, is going to pull between 600 and 800 watts. How long can I run my refrigerator off of one battery? Yeah. Hour and a half. All right, two hours if, if I... Yeah. Now, there's a couple things that we can do. Okay, now in between, because I'm cheap, I'll show you how to take care of this. First thing is, is when you're traveling down the road, and I've already done the test on this, it takes roughly about four hours for my refrigerator at temperature to get above something that is, say, above 45 degrees, okay? But I also prep. I look at my refrigerator, I figure out what's in the inside, okay? I've got meat, I've got dairy, you know, vegetables, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you know, condiments and, you know, uh, beer, right? <laughs> what I do is I take my meat and my dairy and I put it in the freezer, okay? Now, by doing that, all that's left is my vegetables inside my condiments and my beer. I've already told you what to do with the beer, put it in the front seat, drink it before it gets warm. If you do that, all that you have in there, of course, is your vegetables, you know, cheese. Apparently cheese tastes better when it's warm. Can those, you know, those items that you leave in your refrigerator, can they withstand the 50 degrees eventually or something like that? I'm gonna say four hours. I've done a video and I felt that it would be too boring to put out there because I, I conducted the test set it up, time lapse, everything else. I had over six hours before my refrigerator got to 45 degrees. You know, traveling, and what it is, I, I, I did it fair as well. It was in the summer in Texas, where there's real heat, right? You have to drive Fords because you got to get, Ram, Ram can't do it. it. Took six hours for my refrigerator to go from temperature, fully, you know, fully loaded, from temperature up to 45 degrees. My freezer, and we've done this multiple times, go from Texas to Florida, eight hour a day before I even got close to 30 degrees. So a lot of this stuff, we don't have to run it continuously, we just gotta prep. Now there's some things that I can do to also keep my refrigerator cold, right? We just go old school, take an old 
a gallon of water, pour out about a, a fourth of it, right? So I've got three quarters of a gallon, stick that in the freezer the night before, freeze it. Second law of thermodynamics, heat runs to cold. I take that frozen you know, a gallon, stick it in the refrigerator. The heat that may be warming up there goes to that and keeps it cold, okay? So there's some things that you can do, because again, I'm not here to say you need to have solar. This is just the possibilities. Exhaust all other options first. Me being cheap, I'm gonna find a way to go, I don't have to do that. Now, I know that a lot of you go, Todd, I could just run on propane down the road. I'm one of the only ones that says this, but I'm the only one that's right. It's not illegal for you to drive with your propane on, it's just stupid, okay? In order to run propane, that means there's an open flame. Okay, and our refrigerators are typically in the kitchen, but typically in the slide out. And that slide out is located where? In proximity, say, to my tires. Right above, right above them. And what type of tires do we have on our RVs? Explosive. <laughs> <laughs> what are they made of? Rubber. Well, you think. The outside is rubber. Steel belted. Now, it's not, not that big of a deal if we have a flat, but if we have tread separation. Now I've just got steel belts slapping everything, right? And if my propane line comes down that way, typically on the street side, when I go to a slide out, do I use black pipe in a slide out? Nope, I use rubber. Do you think that rubber's gonna withstand steel belted radial hitting it? No. Okay, we have more fires in the RV space because we think that it is okay for us to drive down the road with our propane on. I'm not saying that you're gonna explode. Heck, I, I get people all the time, Todd, I've been doing it for 20 years. Okay, you're an exception. It happens, it, it can happen. Right? So I'm not a proponent of you driving with your propane on. Totally get it, it's legal. Except for in two locations. Going into tunnels and stopping and getting fuel. Those of you that swear by driving with your propane on, do you stop before you get to the fuel station, turn your propane off, and then drive in? Probably not. Same people who said that they, you know, put water in their lead acid batteries. And don't. <laughs> All right. So there's some things that you could do. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get on that topic there, but I don't want you guys thinking, well, I could just switch to that. Please don't, okay? Save your RV, take away that hazard, don't drive with your propane on, right? Save it for whenever you're parked. It's gonna actually extend the life of that um, uh, refrigerator as well. So do some switching. But yes, can you get a small, let me get back to this. I'm gonna go through all the options. Do you have an inverter already installed in your RV? Yes. All right, so you have that. So you have some questions. Does the model you have, I want you to go over to your breaker panel box, open that up, you're gonna look down at the bottom, and this is where your converter is gonna be located. I want you to look for a little switch. LALI, all right, so you already have that, so that consideration is taken. The question is, is do you invest in a second or third lead acid battery, or go ahead and go lithium? All right, so now I'm spending your money. Yes, that's all that you have to do. Now, one thing I would say, if you're going with two lithium batteries, there's gonna be you know, those cables that you make, just make sure they're the same size, same length, right? Treat the two batteries, act as one. All right, well, all right, so let's go ahead and get, someone else asked that as well. And you have a Ford, no, so that's fine. All right, so here we have. Now, there's one thing that I didn't go over, and that is that voltage goes downhill. Everyone stick your hands out, both hands out if you don't mind. I want you to imagine you got a clear pipe of water, clear pipe of water there. And I'm gonna tell you the adage that voltage runs downhill. So if you lower one side, you got a clear pipe of water, where's that water going? The low side, right? You know, voltage is the same way. Electrons are the same way. High volts to low volts. That's where they go, okay? Because they're lazy. There's a thought, well, my lithium battery is 14.4 volts. My battery inside my truck is 12 volts. Will that lithium battery damage my lead acid battery? Nope. Because first off, when we say 12 volts, it's nominally 12 volts. In other words, eh, 12 volts. 
We already said that a lead acid battery fully charges 12.7 volts. If the battery is low, we will charge at 14 volts. So we're not worried about that, but here is where we're worried. We have a truck, we have an alternator. And the alternator in our trucks, in most cases, are stupid. They will work at maximum duty as long as there's no back pressure, no static pressure. So in other words, if I'm sending out power and there's no back feed saying, hey, I don't need to use you, they will run at 100% duty. Your alternator is not designed to run at 100% duty. We always try and put in a bigger alternator than what the constant duty load is, so that way that alternator can run at, say, 50% duty. Whenever we are charging lithium batteries, they can charge at an extreme rate, 100 amps. If you've got multiple, well, now you double that, 200 amps. If my inverter can only push 100 amps at a time, it'll run 100 amps if I'm plugged into just a lithium battery. So people will say, wait a minute, we're going to ruin our alternator if we put in lithium batteries. Correct? All right. One more factor. The size of the cable between that alternator going through my seven pin connector and finally over. All right? Now, I taught you in the first class here that electrons have space, right? What determines the size of the wire? Well, the amount of amperage I'm pushing through, right? We give them different gauges, and again, this is actually by an engineer, because if you look at the gauge, you think the higher the gauge, the bigger the wire? Nope. <laughs> Dig them, engineers. All right, well, we have a small 16-gauge wire that goes from our alternator all the way back, so it can only produce, only allow so many amps. Second adage when we're talking about electricity is distance is resistance. Once you think about all those push carts, right? So if we don't do any upgrades, to our truck. In other words, I don't run a special cable from my battery up front all the way through and connect it back. I will not potentially damage that alternator just by putting in lithium batteries because the line itself is going to be the inhibitor. It's going to be, you know, my limiter. Now, if I wanted to charge them fast, I would get two, two gauge wire or something like that, run it from the battery all the way back, put on some Anderson connectors and charge it. Then I'll go, ooh, now I'm gonna damage that. But no, if you're putting that on there, the truck has its own limitations, you're fine. See how I take a short, quick answer? <laughs> because people will come up, what about this situation? So I go through all of them. No, I play one on TV though. No, actually, I went to school. <laughs> this is how, okay, you remember when you're young and you make stupid decisions? I was gonna be an engineer, but then I looked at everyone and I thought they were all dorks. <laughs> so I switched. <laughs> I was like, these guys don't take showers. <laughs> they sleep in the elevator at night. Seriously, because they study all this. You don't need to study that much. Right, so I switched. I was like, nah, I don't wanna, I don't. So, Looking back, yeah, I would, I would have finished that up, but I made a stupid decision that says I don't want to be, I don't want to be associated with the smelly people. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so I resemble that. <laughs> yes, sir. But, um, you know, the system you just described that you have in your rig is a pretty robust system. Yes. Is it the same thing you probably want to spend the money or uh, have all that, that much equipment? Yeah. So, right, you know, you know, you know, so there's all different sizes, right? So it all depends on what you're doing. So I'm still going to dance around this, but let's do this. Let's just go with one inverter, 3,000 watt inverter. I can run one air conditioner or one microwave. Can't run them both at the same time, right? And it all depends. Now, the thing about lithium batteries, oh, another great thing. I can add more batteries later on. When I have that extreme life cycle of 10,000 cycles, I've got a flat discharge curve. I can add another lithium battery a year later, another lithium battery a year later, right? So what I want to do is I want to look at, say, my inverter, and I would say get a 3,000 watt inverter, okay? That's just the standard. I can run the whole house. I can run the air conditioner or the microwave, right? Some other things on there. 
In order for me to get 3,000 watts, again, I look at my battery. My battery is 100 amps. That's what it can push continuously, or 10 amps. In order for me to get 3,000 watts, I need three batteries. So if we set a system with a 3,000 watt inverter, a minimum of three lithium batteries, things in between there, you're looking at about $6,000 in equipment. Okay. I've got a multi plus 3000 watt inverter and I've got four battle points, 100 amp hour added batteries. So you make me feel better now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. I, and here's the thing, okay? Because when you dabble, I will say this solar is an addictive drug. <laughs> Seriously, it's an addictive drug. You're going to start off, well, and this is what I, you know, you know this is what I'm going to start off with, and basically, this is what I'm going to budget for. You know, and then you get that two hours. You're like, oh, this is great. This is awesome. I did that with, you know, Chad. We set him up over at Changing Lanes. He gave me a call after one hour. Todd, this is so awesome. I was able to run my AC. It was all that great. I need more. <laughs> it happens. Okay. Now, here's the thing. You can gradually get into it. You can add batteries later on. You can add more batteries if they're lithium. You don't have to buy them at once. Lead acid, you have to buy them all at once, kind of like tires, okay? Solar panels, you can start off with a smaller amount and continue to add. The key factor is, is buying the right size inverter to whatever it is right now, okay? Yeah, but you're looking at about six grand, seven grand in materials in order to be off grid for a couple hours a day. Speak to the advantage of going 24 volt versus 12 volt. Yeah, all right, so for those of you that are a little techy, Right, and we're buying a larger system, right? If we increase our voltage, we, re we reduce our amperage. Volts times amps equals watts. If I double my volts, I can cut my amps in half. One thing about electrons, when we get them to move, as they move, they create heat. The more they move, the more heat they create. <coughs> we quantify that based on amperage. So if I can cut my amperage in half, I reduce the heat. Heat destroys everything in our RV. Right? So if I can lower the amperage, I can reduce the size of the wire, which I'm not big on, but I can extend the life of those cables. Right? The advantage is, is I'm reducing the heat. If I'm building a system, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get in the weeds here. When I build a system, I always over cable because the goal is if I run that thing full bore, I should only be about 10 degrees above the ambient temperature. What's acceptable on these cables is 90 degrees Celsius. It's 140 degrees, right? 70 degrees Celsius, 140 degrees. That's going to melt that over time, right? To me, when you get into a huge system, yes, 24 volts to cut the amps in half. But I mean, that's something we'll cut. You know, I wouldn't say on a on a single inverter, it's not worth, not worth it. Okay, so. All right. Yeah. Any other? Yes, sir. That was the, that's why you raised your hand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're going to love my class. <laughs> Go ahead. Again, I'd go back to what do you want to do? I mean, are you the type that doesn't need the air conditioner? The RV, right. In other words, you travel where there's 70 degree weather. You don't have to run three ACs. Your RV has wheels. Well, uh, and again, with your plus package, is it a 3,000 watt inverter that's in there? Yes. Okay, so you can run your air conditioner about an hour and a half full cycle, okay. right? So probably about three hours, okay. if we said 50% duty. <coughs> you know, and for a lot of people, three hours of travel. Now, the thing is, is if you got an eight hour day, 
Are you going to turn it on in the very beginning? Right. Okay. Do you stop in those six hours? Oh, yeah. Right. So when we first started, it was we'd run our generator. By the way, if you have an onboard generator, guess what you can do? Driving down the road. Turn your generator on, right? So we got in the habit, our last stop two hours out, then we'd kick on the air conditioner, right? Yeah. If I'm limited. Right. Yep, you can do that from, yeah, depending on the system you have, yeah, yeah you can do that, right? So, you know, I mean, it's not about, you know, is my system big enough? It's how long can I run that? And then can I adapt to that? But if you start doing that, right, two hours isn't going to be enough. <laughs> this is great. What else can we do? And that's, that's why I set that vision in the very beginning. Literally, it does change your RVing, right, your experience. And now, if you're brand new to it, this is great. You want to get into it, great. But if you're kind of in a rut, believe me, when you do something like that and you, you basically have, you know, endless stuff that you can run for six, seven hours a day, man, this changes. Oh, now we can do this. Now we can park over here. Now we can stay over here. And it changes how you RV, right? And I used to do seminars on which RV is right for me. I like, you know, they're like, I've been, you know, in a fifth wheel for years, you know, should I switch? Sure, it changes the game. I still haven't driven in a motorhome because I have a bucket list item. I want to do the hot swap. I want to be driving down the road going, I need to go to the bathroom, take the wheel. <laughs> I think that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, just for the audience, address the safety issue of lithium iron phosphate batteries. Okay, so there's the question. Because some of you, you know, with your Dodges, you bought Samsung phones. <laughs> now, there's different types of lithium out there. There's lithium iron phosphate. There's lithium cobalt. And whenever we started really dabbling into this, lithium cobalt is the most dense material so far that we have found that we get, we produce the most amount of power. The problem with lithium cobalt is, is it's kind of volatile. So when lithium first hit the scene, we started putting them in cell phones and we used lithium cobalt. Man, these batteries would last forever. The problem is, is because if we added just a little bit of heat or don't let them vent, they would go into a thermal overload, right? Stick them on the pillow or something like that, your pillow catch on fire. Well, we switched over to lithium iron phosphate about five years ago, far less volatile, far less volatile. But this is the reason why whenever you go on an airplane, Guess what you have to do? You have to take your laptop with you. You have to take your cell phone with you. You can't put it in your travel bag, okay? Now, they've got other reasons for it, but, you know, putting that up there. Lithium iron phosphate is far superior when it comes to safety over lithium cobalt. You may just hear lithium ion, it's lithium iron phosphate, different chemical altogether. Pretty dig I'm safe. And they put the controllers not on the battery. The BMSs, BMS yeah. And they shut down. Now, for those of you that have lithium, okay, and I'll, I'll end with this. Are we almost done? Yeah. Okay. There's one thing that you need to know as an end user. Yes, we do have these BMSs in here, okay? The BMS protects the battery, and this is how it protects. I want you to think of a, just a, a relay, a switch. So too much voltage that goes out, too much amperage that goes out, or anything else, that BMS will go to sleep. That's what I'm going to call it. It goes to sleep. It shunts the power. So you go from 14 volts to zero volts. And it happens like that, right? You have to have another charge source to wake it back up. This is 12 volts. How many of you had your laptop, something like that? Something goes wrong with your laptop, you call the help desk. What's the number one question that the help desk, IT help desk, ask you? Have you turned it off, turned it on? Now, I say that 12 volts is the brains of the operation. That is true. But with brains, we have brain farts. How do we reset 12 volts? Turn it off, turn it back on. You know, so you never have to do that with 120 volts, but 12 volts you do that. It's the same thing with these lithium batteries. They put technology inside that runs off 12 volts. It goes into protection mode, it goes to sleep. And you go from 14 volts to zero volts. And I get this question a lot, my battery's just dead. No, it's not dead. Inside, I've got a little circuit board that simply just opened a switch and says, nope, we're not letting it through. The way to wake it back up Provide 12 volts, kind of shock it. So those of you that have lithium batteries, all of a sudden they die, try and plug in your converter to shore power. Plug in your truck or ram, 
seven pin connector to wake that back up. You have to wake them back up. All of a sudden it goes from zero to 14 volts. That is the one quirk that we have with these lithium batteries. You know, that a lot of people don't know. It's like, my batteries are dead, what do I do? If we can supply another 12 volt charge to it, you'll be amazed that they just simply wake up. Energy can't be created or destroyed, we can only change its state. It doesn't go anywhere, it's just asleep. Yes? You kept throwing the term BMS out. What's Battery it, management system, okay. BMS. So most lithium batteries you buy, it's internal, it's already there. It's not something you buy, it's just, you know, we're having to let you know because it adds a new quirk. My battery's just dead, what do I do? All right, yes ma'am, time. Oh, I picked on my wife, I was, she had a question. I thought she was gonna learn, Todd, teach me solar. All right, you wanna finish up here? Yeah. All right. Everybody give it up for Todd, isn't he awesome? Hey guys, this is a great class. I got to have some fun with uh, you Alliance RV owners. You made it super interesting. If this is something that you like, go ahead and consider coming over to the National RV Training Academy and signing up for a class or at least getting the home study where you get another 15, 20 hours with me. Oh, where are you gonna find this stuff? Down here in the description. Just scroll down. It's right there.